Hello and welcome to tonight's program with our mystery writers. We have Mariah Fredericks and Susan Elia McNeil and Karen White with us this evening. And it is my pleasure to introduce them to you. So a few words about each of our authors for tonight. We're starting in alphabetical order. We have Mariah Fredericks, the author of the Jane Prescott mystery series, which is set in 1910s New York. She was born and raised in New York City and graduated from Vassar College with a degree in history. The Jane Prescott series of historical mysteries follows the adventures of ladies maid Jane Prescott, who serves the wealthy and celebrated of 1910s New York society. Beginning with a death of no importance, Jane makes her way in a world filled with industrialists and anarchists, society ladies and suffragettes, the woman no one notices but who sees everything. The latest book in the series, Death of an American Beauty, has been nominated for the Mary Higgins Clark Award. Susan Elia McNeil is the author of the New York Times, Washington Post, Publishers Weekly, and USA Today best-selling Maggie Hope mystery series, starting with the Edgar Award nominated and Barry Award winning Mr. Churchill's Secretary, which is now in its 22nd printing. Her books include Princess Elizabeth Spy, Her Majesty's Hope, The Prime Minister's Secret, The Queen's Accomplice, The Paris Spy, The Prisoner in the Castle, and The King's Justice. The Maggie Hope novels have been nominated for the Edgar, the McCavity, the ITW Thriller, the Barry, the Dillis, the Sue Federer Historical Fiction, and the Bruce Alexander Historical Fiction Awards. The Maggie Hope series is sold worldwide in English and has been translated into Czech, Spanish, Mandarin, Cantonese, and Turkish. It is also available in large print and audio. Actress Daisy Ridley, has bought the film and television rights to the series. And Karen White is the New York Times bestselling author of 27 books, including the Trad Street series, Dreams of Falling, The Nights the Lights Went Out, Flight Patterns, The Sound of Glass, A Long Time Gone, and The Time Between. She is the co-author of All the Ways We Say Goodbye, The Glass Ocean, and The Forgotten Room, with New York Times bestselling authors, Beatrice Williams and Lauren Willig. Raised in a house full of brothers, Karen's love of books and strong female characters first began in the third grade when the local librarian issued her a library card and placed The Secret of the Old Clock, a Nancy Drew mystery in her hands. Karen's roots run deep in the South where many of her novels are set, her intricate plot lines, and compelling characters charm and captivate readers with just the right mix of family drama, mystery, intrigue, and romance. Please welcome tonight's guests. Thank you. I am Mariah Fredericks, and my series is set in the New York of the 1910s, and it features Jane Prescott, who is the ladies' maid to shy, introverted Louise Tyler, who is trying to make her way in New York society as a new bride. Uh, this series began with A Death of No Importance, which was set 1910-1911. Uh, the books progressed year by year, and with the third book, Death of an American Beauty, we're in 1913, and Jane is on vacation. She's a cultured New York gal, so her first stop is the Armory Show and the Notorious Gallery Eye, where the Cubists are doing new and strange things to the human form. Uh, from there, she goes to her uncle's refuge on the Lower East Side for women who are trying to leave a certain profession. Uh, every year, the women kick up their heels at what's facetiously called the Southern Baptist Ladies' Cotillion, or the Whore's Ball. Um, this year, one of the women is found murdered, and Jane's uncle, who's sort of a cranky, contrarian character, is the main suspect. So, so much for poor Jane's holiday. 
Um, when I started thinking about this book and how I was going to fill 280 pages, uh, the first thing that I knew was that Jane was going to be on vacation. And there were a few reasons for that. Um, one, purely selfishly, it's easier on the writer if her amateur sleuth can be relieved of her mating duties for a book and be out and free to solve crime. Uh, second, Jane is a young woman, and I wanted her to have some fun, because I didn't let her have a lot of fun in the first two books. And thirdly, um, in the first two books, I explored very much the gilded side of New York's gilded age, and here I wanted to look at the lives of women who weren't as wealthy. So the book really started with this image of a young woman at liberty and exploring her city and the issues of freedom and movement and space were really on my mind as I started looking at what was happening in 1913. And in 1913, bodies are literally moving differently. They're moving to new dance steps, to new music, uh, new clothing constraints. Um, and some people are moving into spaces that they haven't been allowed to occupy before. And that creates fear and hatred. And hatred and fear may be societally uh, regrettable and toxic, but for a mystery writer, they're, they're, they're best friends. So um, if you know the series or you've heard me talk about it before, you know I generally try and pick a signature event from the year it's set to sort of um, thematically inform the why and who done it of the murder. And the first event that jumped out at me in 1913 is it's the 50th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation. It's also the year that Woodrow Wilson segregates all federal workers, which shows you how far we had and had not come. So New York was originally not so wild about the Emancipation Proclamation because we felt it was bad for business. But 50 years on, many people feel it's a really good excuse for a party. Um, so as I was trying to think about how to examine this issue and where America was uh, on the issues of race and liberty at this time, I went at it in a few different ways. Um, one was um, sort of the lighter side. Louise gets involved in a pageant, the kind that if you saw Florence Foster Jenkins, you'll be familiar with. Society women put on a sort of cultural tableau. Um, and here they get together to celebrate the emancipation in what I hope is truly cringeworthy fashion. Oh, I thought you were in there. The lights on. Um, Louise herself plays Lincoln. Um, is this the light on? Somebody needs to I'll mute. I'll turn it off, Ellen. I'll turn it off. Um, I'll just hold on for a sec. Um, on the more serious side, one of the women who is integral to solving the mystery suffered a, suffered a loss in what's called the 1900 Tenderloin Race Riot. Um, the event is dramatized in the Nick. Um, it has some similarities to the draft riots. Um, in 1900, a woman named May Enoch was uh, standing outside McBride's saloon uh, on 41st and 8th Avenue, and she was waiting for her partner, Arthur Harris, inside. And a white plainclothes policeman named Robert, hey, Robert came by, and seeing a woman of color standing outside a saloon drew the conclusion that she was obviously a prostitute. He then tried to arrest her. Naturally, May Enoch resisted and started screaming for help. And her partner came out of the bar and saw some random guy trying to pull his partner down the street. A fight ensued. 
uh, Officer Thorpe hit Arthur Harris with his club and Arthur Harris stabbed him and killed him. Obviously this created a lot of tension in the city. Uh, mourners visited the Thorpe family, police officers held a vigil outside the bar, liquor started to flow, tempers started to flare, and the idea of revenge took hold. And soon hundreds of people, including police officers, were rampaging through the streets and attacking Black New Yorkers. Uh, people were hit with knives and clubs and bats. Nooses were strung up on lampposts. People were pulled off of streetcars and attacked. This went on for a few days. Um, there were no official fatalities, uh, but there were many complaints of police brutality. Uh, there was an official inquiry. No officer was punished. But Arthur Harris uh, spent the rest of his life in Sing Sing. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in May Enoch, we have a prime example of someone who is in a space that she's, people don't expect her to be. So she's controversial, she's criminal, and the consequences in this case were sadly fatal. The woman, the issue of women at liberty is also part of the pageant subplot because it takes place at Rutherford's department store. Now, sadly, all of our great department stores are sort of dying out now, but in 1913, they were still kind of a new, exciting thing. Um, and the reason for that lies in Edward Filene, when he opened his store, called it an atomless Eden, because this was a place where women could go out in public, unescorted, and exert consumer power. And this was a pretty heady thing at the time. Um, now, not everybody could afford to buy this liberty, but Louise Tyler certainly can. And of course, Jane goes along with her. Um, culturally, things are freer as well. Long before uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald has Bernice bob her hair, dance sensation Irene Castle cut hers in 1913 or 14. New York is the city of the dreadful dance as young people give up the waltz and start doing the turkey trot and the grizzly bear. And they're dancing to ragtime, which to us is like the quintessentially old time music. But if you listen to it with fresh air ears, it really has this fabulous sort of bounce and get up and go. And it feels incredibly youthful and fun. And many of the song titles are quite naughty. They capitalize on the erotic vagaries of the word it, like everyone's doing it now. And, once you, after you've gotten what you want, you don't want it. Um, <laughs> so Jane, of course, is solving crimes, but uh, I did let her go dancing with a young man named Leo Hirschfeld, whose career I based loosely on Irving Berlin's. So those are just, you know, some of the trends and events that inform death of an American beauty. And I really love writing historical mysteries because they let me think about the somewhat morbid question, why do we kill each other in America? Um, why, why do we fear each other? Who feels entitled to take life? Who do we feel their lives matter? Who do we feel their lives do not matter? I always try and include one death in the book that excites a lot of public reaction, a lot of outrage, and then one where the public and possibly even the reader goes, eh, you know, eh, maybe they weren't so sympathetic, maybe they had it coming, to sort of challenge our ideas about, you know, how seriously do we take murder and death sometimes. Um, in the second book, Death of a New American, the public is gripped by the sinking of the Titanic. They're less interested in the death of a young Italian immigrant. The death of an American beauty 
Um, the murder of sex workers does, former sex workers, excuse me, does excite a certain lurid fascination, but there's also a sense of, well, you know, they didn't lead the cleanest, most organized lives, you can't really be surprised. And there's another death that goes almost completely unnoticed. But happily, Jane Prescott ventures forth into spaces that are thrilling and comical and at times perilous because someone feels she should not be there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariah. We'll take questions after everyone has spoken. So I'm going to switch our spotlight to Susan Elia McNeil. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, <clears throat> you know, I just have to say that I'm such a fan of these two women authors that I'm being shown with. So it's, it's like such a treat to be here. So thank you, Giovanna. Um, so I write the Maggie Hope mysteries and I know it's probably shocking to hear me speak with such an American accent. <laughs> But I'll tell you, it was totally, um, completely unplanned. Um, I was actually doing some creative writing, but I was definitely in the um, the New York City single girl, sex in the city kind of genre. Um, when my husband, who's a Muppet, and yes, I did say <laughs> Muppet, um, he played the role of Bear on Bear in the Big Blue House on Disney Channel. If you have kids of a certain age, um, you'll remember it. But uh, Bear in the Big Blue House was really big in uh, the UK. And so we went to London for about eight weeks, I think, or eight, eight to 10 weeks. And um, it was it was an amazing experience. And one of the first things I did, um, we went out to a pub with a friend of ours. And he said, um, he brought me a copy of Time Out London, because I was kind of on my own over there. And he, he opened it up to this ad, tiny little ad for the, the war rooms, the, what they now call the Churchill war rooms, um, and said, you know, despite what you Yanks might think, um, World War II did not start with Pearl Harbor. And so I, I just took it as this challenge to go to this museum, and I went. And um, it was so interesting. It was like in the middle of a snowstorm, so already it was sort of like this magical, fantastical world. And I went and there was, there was nobody there really. Um, it was, you know, winter and, and you know, um, so the tourists weren't really around and then there was the snowstorm. So there I am wandering um, the bunker where Churchill and his colleagues basically fought World War II. Um, and it's, uh, it's underground, it's near 10 Downing Street, but it's not below 10 Downing Street. Um, it's underneath this huge slab of concrete, which makes it bomb proof. Although I'm really glad they never had to test it because I don't really know that it's completely bomb proof, but um, thank goodness it never was tried. And um, I walked the same halls that Winston Churchill and his colleagues walked and it looks, the same. And actually the whole museum was left um, when it was left after VE Day. Um, it was just sort of boarded up and all of the, the push pins were in place and the maps and all of the telephones were set where they were and everything was the way it was. And that's the way it is now. That's the way they reopened it. So there's this uncanny sense of, you know, walking into a time capsule. And that's what really struck me walking around. And the other thing that happened was um, I was doing one of those audio tours, you know, where you get to walk around with your headset. And um, there was uh, a memoir by one of Winston Churchill's uh, secretaries. Um, and her name was Mrs. Elizabeth Layton Nell. And um, she was very young when she was working for him during the war. And she wrote a memoir of her experiences. She, she loved him. She really did love him. He was hard, like, you know, a very hard taskmaster. And they had to work incredibly long hours. But they did all really adore him. And um, she wrote this delightful uh, memoir, which is now back in print. Um, and later on, I was able to correspond with her. She was in her 80s. She was living in South Africa. Um, she had married her Royal Air Force 
captain from the war that she'd been seeing. Um, and she was very kind in talking to this like American, <laughs> probably thought I was like some crazy American woman, but you know, about her novel and, you know, writing about what, what was really going on in the war rooms. And um, it was just such a delightful experience. So I do feel like I have this moment of um, contact both through the war rooms themselves, like just walking those halls, but also in being able to talk um, through the mail, you know, back when it was like air, air mail, like those blue envelopes, like, I don't think people even do that anymore because of email, but um, we were, we were writing and posting our letters and they were going back and forth from New York to South Africa. And um, it was just such an amazing experience to be able to correspond with someone who actually worked for Winston Churchill and who really did live through all of that. So I was so grateful for her guidance and like to be able to just have a connection that was really wonderful to me. Um, so that's how the idea of a World War II novel came to me. And I was completely overwhelmed. And I remember coming back to the hotel and just saying to my husband, um, I, I really want to do this, but I can't because it's not my country and it's not my time period. I think I could do one. I think I could do the other, but I don't think I can do both. And then he said, well, what if you made the character an American. And as it turns out, Elizabeth Leighton Nell was actually Canadian. So it wasn't that far of a reach to make her a British citizen, but who grew up in America. And so that's when the idea of Maggie Hope kind of took off. And I had been able to see where the secretaries worked and typed uh, in the war rooms. And I just had this idea in my head of someone who was perhaps a bit frustrated by that and who might have like these other talents that would aid the war effort and wouldn't be allowed to use them because of course she's female. So um, Maggie grew up in uh, Wellesley, Massachusetts and she went to Wellesley College, which is an all women's college. And even then it was just, you know, the faculty was 50% women and women were taken seriously and she was able to like do things at MIT and she became a math major and was incredibly gifted with math and codes and things like that. And, um, you know, she really kind of thought she could help the war effort that way, but no, she had to work as a secretary. But, um, but then um, she finds a bit of code and decodes it. And it was interesting because as I was writing this, a lot of things were coming to light um, from, British history, there was like a 50 year moratorium on a lot of the more secret files, including this one picture of an advertisement. It was an advertisement for women's dresses and it was hand drawn, a very intricate drawing. And in the, um, in this actual advert um, were all these dots and dashes like that were part of the seams of the clothing. And as it turns out, that was actually Nazi code. And this was only discovered, or it was only, it was discovered then, but it was only released like in the late nineties. So I was able to like find that. And that became like the whole inspiration for Maggie's reason for being and her able to be of use during the war and things kind of went on from there. She, she solves this code and she impresses Winston Churchill and she ends up becoming a spy for SOE and Again, that's another place where um, you know women weren't women weren't spies before World War II, really, um, and they really weren't supposed to be in World War II either, according to the Geneva Convention. But um, a lot of women went behind enemy lines um, to France, in particular, um, to to do what they could to fight the Nazis. So Maggie becomes part of that sisterhood, which I think is just amazing. I have so much respect for those women. Um, and so she has all these different adventures. Um, the, the one nice thing um, about the books is that you can, you can pick them up anywhere. Um, you don't have to start at the beginning. I think it's better if you start at the beginning, but you don't have to start at the beginning. Um, it's all sort of self-explanatory um, and you get the idea of where she is and what, what's going on. So in the, the latest book that just came out in paperback, um, The King's Justice, which, ooh, <laughs> Um, Maggie's back in London, which is always, I, I always love it when she comes back to London because she has her friends there. She has a really good friend, David. She has her friend, Chuck. Um, she's got this 
detective that she's dating. She's actually adopted a cat, which kind of gives her a bit of a more maternal aspect, I think, sometimes. Um, so she's back in London, and she's she's just so burned out because she's been in Paris, and she's been a prisoner um, of the SOE, and it's just been so hard. So she she basically quits and throws it all up into the air and decides to do her own thing, which is to defuse bombs because that's relaxing. Um, anyway, so she's diffusing bombs, but her detective um, boyfriend thinks she'd really be interested in this case about a stolen Stradivarius. And so she gets involved and the Stradivarius leads to some other things, including this old enemy that she had who's a serial killer who's now in the Tower of London basically on death row and he only wants to talk to her and they have a little bit more in common than she would have thought so that's how the King's Justice goes so um, I'm very excited about that coming out in paperback and the next book in the series is called The Hollywood Spy and it's coming out in July and July 6th, I think. And in that book, Maggie comes back to the United States, which is really fun. And she gets to go to LA. And um, there are some crazy things going on in the US in 1943. There are race riots. There's the Zoot Suit Riot. There were a lot of things that I was writing about in the summer of 2020 that were incredibly familiar. And like, Mariah was saying, like, we've come so far, and yet we haven't. Um, so that was a really, really interesting thing to write. I'm, I'm really excited for that one to come out, and I can't wait to hear what you guys think. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. I'm going to spotlight our next author, Karen White. I'm, I'm muting myself. We're good. We're good. Okay. There we are. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I really enjoyed listening to um, the other two authors um, making notes of the books that I, I need to read. Um, and I love hearing about the Winston Churchill and the War Rooms. I lived in London for seven years. Um, and actually, my next book coming out in April, which is not part of the series, um, The Last Night in London, takes place in London in the building where I lived. Um, I'm very, I was very fortunate when I was growing up that I lived in London for seven years um, during the 80s when the War Rooms weren't open yet. So mm -hmm. I've been back to London many times that I have yet to go back there. We were supposed to go back last year. Well, we know what happened in 2020. So did not happen. Um, but I hope to soon because um, while writing my book, I fell in love with Winston Churchill. My gosh, we need more leaders like that. You just, just made it happen. So I just have this tremendous respect for the man I just and his wife who had to put up with a lot <laughs> but um just really incredible stories so um but yeah so I'm Karen White and I'm the author of the Trad Street series I've um written 28 books um but only seven um in the Trad Street series um I have them all listed right I finally figured <laughs> what was I don't know what was happening with my background but that's all seven of them and if you will notice the Final one, book number seven, it's not out yet. It will be out in no on November 2nd of this year. And I hope to actually do a physical tour for that because by golly, this plague has got to be under control by then because I can't take it anymore. I'm sure a lot of us feel the same way. Thank goodness for books, right? Um, so when I, the, the House on Trad Street is the first book and this is what I call, so it's set in Charleston and it's what I called my, um, Moonlighting meets um, National Treasure meets The Sixth Sense. So in the first book, we meet our protagonist, who is a protagonist through the entire series, Melanie Middleton. And she is a realtor in Charleston. She specializes in historic real estate, but she hates old houses because she can see dead people. And dead people in these old, these old houses always have lingering spirits who want her help in solving a mystery. So in the very first book, she inherits a house on Trad Street. Now, Trad Street is south of Broad in Charleston. It is a very desirable area to be in, and it's a big, beautiful house that needs a lot of work. She inherits it, and at the same time, she 
meet Jack Trenum, who is a true crime mystery writer, who's writing a book about someone who lived in the house she inherits in the 1920s during prohibition and mysteriously disappeared. So they, of course, put their um, minds together and start solving this mystery. And that is the first mystery. And throughout this series, the backdrop, of course, is Melanie. She's a little bit OCD. She has a labeling gun and she does spreadsheets for everything. Um, she's very alone in the first book. So even though a lot of there's ghosts and there's mystery and there's history and there's all sorts of really interesting things going on in this series, but the real highlight of the story is Melanie and um, it's very character driven uh, because in the beginning she's very alone. In the first book, she has one friend. <laughs> she's estranged from both parents. And by the time you get to, to book seven, her life has expanded exponentially. And um, it's very interesting to see. And that's why I, I, I think it was um, uh, Mariah who, or it, it could have been Susan who said, um, yes, you can read them individually. Each book has its own mystery, but it's a lot more fun, especially when they're character driven to start from the beginning. So you really understand their origin story. And when you start seeing in the other characters who come on board and you get to understand how they came to be in Melanie's orbit. But it's always very much about Melanie and her coming to grips with this, what she calls a goiter on her neck. And other people call a gift because she can speak to spirits and she can solve these mysteries. Um, and a lot of times when they speak to her, you know, she does this kind of thing and starts singing ABBA songs because that's her way. <laughs> that's her way to sort of ignore these, these spirits. Um but she and Jack, um, they have a relationship. It's very, very tense in the first books. And then it may or may not become a romance as we get towards the end. But The Attic on Queen Street, which is the seventh book, will be the final book in the series. But so many fans wrote to me and said, please, you cannot end the series. But I mean, Susan and Mariah, you know what it's like to write a series and there has to be a point where you have to let the characters just live their happily ever after. And I, you know, I kept on putting them in peril and having cliffhanger, you know, cliffhanger endings. And I just couldn't do that to them anymore. I needed to let them rest in peace and kind of do their thing. So um, my publisher asked me if I would consider doing a spinoff series. So of course I said yes, because it was very hard to, to, to write the end. As a matter of fact, when I wrote the first book, um, it was only going to be two books because I was building my career. I was writing Southern women's fiction, single title books, uh, growing my readership. And then one day while, I take, while taking a shower, the character of Melanie Middleton, the OCD realtor who sees dead people, just slapped me upside the head. And I was sort of really surprised. And I wrote three chapters and I sent it to my agent. She's like, this is very good, but this is very different. Let me send it to your publisher. My editor said the same thing. They were even thinking about changing my name um, for these books because they were very different from what I was writing. And then after I finished the book and I sent it to my agent and an editor, and they both agreed that no, we needed to keep my name because these were still very much character driven, Karen White, Southern fiction books. They just had the added mystery of the ghosts and the historical context. So um, I was able to keep my name and it's been wonderful because readers of my Southern fiction have jumped on to the Trad Street series and Trad Street series fans have jumped on to the other. So it's been one happy family. Um, it's been very great, but yes, there will be a spinoff series. I've started working on it. It's called The Shop on uh, Royal Street. And for those who are familiar with New Orleans, you will know that Royal Street is in New Orleans. And um, the main character will be Nola Trenum, which is Melanie's stepdaughter, who you meet, I think, in book three of the Trad Street series. But it will be 10 years after The Attic on Queen Street. And she is a grown woman and she has moved to New Orleans. So that's all I can say about that, but it will be out in the fall of 2022. So um, yes, keep on, keep on, keep on writing because my, my writers, my readers are just, 
they love these characters as much as I do. I think they're as real as my readers do. And that is the biggest compliment. I'm sure um, Susan and Mariah will agree when, when we hear from readers who really have, have latched onto these characters, like they're friends, they're real people. It is hugely um, thrilling for the author to hear that because of course we think our, our, our characters are real. They're not just in our heads. So. So that is what's going on with me. So we would love to open it up to questions um, or leave it back to uh, Giovanna to, to kind of lead the, the rest of this. But, um, but yeah, that's where I am. Okay, thank you so much. I'm going to actually spotlight the three of you. So you're all on the screen and ask everyone to use the chat box. There were a lot of comments <laughs> during your presentations, uh, a lot of uh, applause. <laughs> That's fantastic. Everyone uh, loves your series. And let's see, you can probably see the chat as well. So I'm going to start off with the first question that I see here from Cynthia. And this is for everybody. How do you make your characters real? I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to start um, just because nobody else spoke up first. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, you know, for me, I guess we've all heard of, um, remember Vivian Lee, they called her, I mean, she went a little bit insane after she did Streetcar Named Desire because she was a character actress. I, I call myself a character um, writer because I don't, to be honest, I don't do any pre-writing. I just start writing my books and the characters just start talking to me. I know that sounds ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I sort of close my eyes and I become that character. And it does help my uh, Triad Street series are written in first person. So I can really jump into Melanie and become her and see the world as this OCD realtor who um, loves donuts and sweets and never gains a calorie. So yeah. <laughs> how does she do that? <laughs> I, I wish I knew, but that's why this is fiction. That's right. <laughs> Well, I'm the exact opposite. I actually, I write a lot of lists and it's interesting because I'm creating some new characters now, actually for a standalone novel. Um, the Maggie Hope series will continue, but I'm taking a bit um, of a left turn to do a standalone. Um, it's set in the 1930s in Los Angeles. And um, one of the things I'm doing with a young female character is doing like a how how is she different from Maggie Hope and making that like a big thing because I really want them to be very um, different from each other. Um, one of the things that I found um, really helpful is like this character wants to be a journalist. And so I researched uh, Martha Gellhorn, who of course was uh, Hemingway's wife, but we also know that she's an amazing writer and there's a wonderful book out now with her letters. And so I was able to really get a sense of Gellhorn through her own words and um, her passions and her energies. And I almost feel like I, some of the, like the vocal tics and some of the, the slang she used, I'm, I'm gonna be able to use and that's pretty cool. And then this woman, it's not just a woman who's young, it's like a mother daughter uh, team. So I honestly, it's so funny because the mother's my age and I really should have a handle on this, I feel. And <laughs> I, I, for the longest time, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. And then I started to go through like, well, okay, she was born this year and I was sort of going through history and like what she would have been doing. And finally, I realized that during her late teens and early twenties, um, she could have been incredibly invested in women's suffrage and once they sort of made that connection and that she was a, a suffragist, um, it all kind of fell into place. And I had like a much clearer picture of who she was. And even though she'd spent like her married years um, as a traditional wife and mom, um, she still had that in, in her character, that sort of like person who's going to upend the status quo and ask for more, that kind of thing. So I guess like connecting with real people in history and just like, I make lists. I'm a list maker. 
Um, I have a very similar experience to Karen, where a character just appeared in my head and was not going to let go. I was actually writing young adult novels for many years, and the first two lines of what became a death of no importance, I will tell it, and I will tell it badly, came into my head, and I was like, who is this person? And it took Jane a while for her to tell me her full story, but once she got going, that was it. And um, I really, the, the era gives me a lot of the characters. I mean, America in the late Gilded Age is an incredibly dynamic time with a lot of great personalities and the language is really dynamic and fun if you look at the newspapers of that era like america is really high on itself um and i try not to put a character on the page until i really can hear them um like with death of an american beauty there was a character i was scared of and then she and I had an argument about gun control and she differed with me very strongly. And I thought, okay, she's real. Um, so it's, uh, I'm writing a book now about the Limburgs and it's the first time I've tried to write actual historical characters. And it, I, I do some of what Susan does in terms of finding the historical signposts and what would be in their head and what, how do they sound in their letters and things like that, so. Okay, thank you. Another question, we have a few questions in here. All right, let me make sure I get to them in order. To any of the authors, who is your favorite character that you have created? From Laura. Well, I'll take that one. Um, <laughs> Maggie Hope has a really amazing best friend named David Green, and David is, um, he's one of the private secretaries for Winston Churchill, and he's been with Churchill through the 30s when Churchill was sort of like, quote unquote, in the wilderness um, and not really part of the, the mainstream political regime. Um, David is also gay. Um, he is in the closet, of course, but he is out to certain very, very, very select people, including Maggie. And I just find David delightful. He's so funny. He's so witty. He's just the coolest guy. And um, I originally based him, he's, he's inspired by three different men that I know, but um, it, he's really sort of just taken off and taken on his own personality. And I can just hear his voice so... Um, so strongly and it's it's so much fun to write so um I, I think for me Melanie is um and I'm neither going to deny or confirm but a lot of people who know me and who have read the Trad Street series see a lot of similarities between mm -hmm. Melanie and me um all I'm going to say is I do own a labeling gun but that's as far <laughs> as you know it. I do not see dead people um but what I I love so much about Melanie, she reminds me, yes, a lot of myself, but a lot of a lot of the the women that I know, and that, you know, we put such a brave face on everything, but you know, inside we're really quivering. <laughs> you know, like Jello, like I don't know, I don't. We just don't know the answers, but we like to pretend that we do, and we have to sort of forge our way because you know, life isn't always easy and, and, and we don't expect it to be, but we do expect to be successful in whatever endeavor that, that we, we attempt. And, um, but we're all, you know, quivering and insecure inside, but we like to, to give a good face to it. And Melanie certainly does. And I just love the way that she fails again and again and again, and yet she keeps on trying. And to me, that's like the best sort of personality anybody could have. Yeah, I would say that Jane Prescott is far and away my favorite. I feel blessed to have had her, have her as a character. I feel very, very lucky. Um, she's, I think what I like about Jane is very, she's witty, um, but she's very generous. I would say that she's a good friend. Um, she's enthusiastic about people. She's enthusiastic about her city. 
Um, the other character I really love writing because she has a terrific arc is her boss, uh, Louise Tyler, who when we meet her is, you know, like this. Um, and she blossoms over the course of the book, um, sometimes surprising Jane that she doesn't just have to listen to her all the time. Um, but she's really been a pleasure to write. Okay, thank you. Next, que next question. What is your favorite part of writing a series? And then the second half of that, what's the biggest challenge? I love the soap opera angle of writing <laughs> a series that you can dive in with these characters and stick with them and see them grow and see them possibly fall in love, possibly fall out of love, um, challenge themselves, make mistakes. Um, and, and readers getting hooked on your characters and wanting to know what happens. I had a reader write to me with the end of the last book. She said, wait a minute, I thought X was going to happen. You set it up like Y. I'm not dealing with Y. It has to be X. And I was like, <laughs> you can just wait. Just wait. Um, the challenge, for me, the challenge is I have a very clear vision of how this series goes, and you hope you just get to tell their whole story. Uh, that's, you know, I, I would be heartbroken not to. So. Um, I, I love not having to invent the wheel every single time. I Because, I you know, I also write single titles, and when you write a single title, it really is reinventing the wheel every single time you, you know, you open that blank page chapter one and there's no given. Whereas when you're doing a series, you have a given, you have a set. I mean, you're introducing new stuff all the time and new characters, but there's always your, your, I mean, for me, it's Charleston, South Carolina. That's a given. I've already, I know it like it's, you know, the, like the back of my hand. So, you know, that's not something I have to, you know, do a lot of heavy research and I, you know, I know the main characters. I just need to come up with a, a, a new plot um, and also in a way to torture the characters. Um, the bad thing is that, yeah, at some point you do have to end the soap opera. You know, nobody wants that. And, and you know, when I wrote the fourth book that was supposed to be the end of the series and I just couldn't stand to write the end. So I wrote an epilogue that left it very clear that there could be a next book. And luckily my publisher agreed and, and they asked me to write three more. So it is very hard to say goodbye. I, I agree with both of you. It's so fun to like pick up and know your main character and know so many of your supporting characters and love them and get to like play with them again. Um, now writing a standalone, and this is my first standalone. It, it, it's hard. It's very hard. Really hard. Like the setting's different. The time, even though it's only, it's like the thirties, not the forties, it's, it's different enough. And it's in America and it's the West coast. I'm not, I'm an East coast girl. So um, yeah, it that that's hard. So it's nice. It's nice to go. It's nice to go back to your familiar beloved characters, but I am having fun creating these these new folks. So. Mm -hmm. Next question from Lynn. How much and what kind of research do you do for your settings and time frames? I do a ridiculous amount of research. I do so much research. I actually, sometimes I worry like I do too much research because I'm actually procrastinating writing a bit, maybe, because yeah. you could just do research <laughs> endlessly. Um, but right now I feel like I really don't know my characters and my setting. So I'm doing a ton and ton, ton, ton of research um, just to kind of feel at home in this time period, in this place, in with these two women who are really unfamiliar to me. Um, so yeah, like the more you can, I think the more you can read things, first person accounts from that time. So like, I feel so lucky to have found Martha Gellhorn's letters. Um, things like that um, are invaluable. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, one of the pluses of writing a series is you have a, a general sense of the era that you're working in. And, you know, I have um, research overlaps, like you'll be doing it for one book, but, oh, that happened in 1915, and we can pull that in in 1916. And, you know, you know, the buildings, you know, the presidents, you know, all these things. Um, so I always have a general outline of 
what I have to research. Like for this, I knew I had to research the riot. I had to research department stores. I had to research Irving Berlin. Um, but I can generally start writing. For me, the biggest the challenge is the physical descriptions of buildings. That always takes an enormous amount of time. And like the, the pointy thing and the, the window that looks like that. That's the thing that takes actually the most time. Yeah. L luckily, my, my daughter has a master's in historic preservation. So if I ever have any question about buildings, I know who to ask. <laughs> Um, but, um, you know, for me, because I believe in suffering for my craft, when I start a new Charleston book, I go and I stay in Charleston, you know, I mean, I have oh, to, yeah. you know, I have to go to the restaurants, I have to walk the streets, I have to, you know, spend a week in Charleston because, I, you know, I do it for my readers and because I am suffering for my craft. So, um, and then I'm, I'm a history nerd. So, you know, each book does have a, um, a historical context. And for the Christmas Spirits on Trad Street, was, which was the last one, was all about the American Revolution in Charleston. Well, I was just like, ooh. Yeah, you know, um, you know, Lafayette and yeah, I love Lafayette. I love learning about how the first place he landed when he came to the United States to help in, in the revolution was in Georgetown, which was right up the coast from Charleston and then stayed in Charleston. And yeah, so I had to, again, I went on the historical tours. I, you know, did all of that um, because I believe in suffering for my craft. And I ate at every single restaurant that is mentioned in the book. So you are welcome. <laughs> Are you muted, Giovanna? Oh, she is. You're muted. Yes, so sorry. I needed to eliminate some background noise. Sorry. So the, you may have answered part of this, some of some of you in, in the previous question about whether this is the question. Do you outline your stories or totally, uh, uh, it says pants them. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what the, what. No, I'm yeah. a pantser for sure. I don't, I don't do much pre anything, so. Maybe I'm lazy. I don't know. I've tried to do it the other way and I can't do it. It drives me crazy. To me, outlining a book is like knowing how a book ends before you write it or before you read it. And I've, I'm not one of those last page readers. So I, I do not, I don't do any planning. Okay. I do some planning because I want certain um, historical events to line up with certain plot points of my characters. So like there's got to be some kind of form to it but I don't I, I'm I don't stick to it so rigidly I'm a plotter I try to be a plotter I try to start with a chapter by chapter outline uh, just so that I mean I know that something happens in each of the chapters there's something to propel the action forward and I'm not just left with my charming characters talking to each other um, but it's not like a bible um, it's just like a structure to build off of. Mm -hmm. This is from Camille. How important is setting or place to your novels? So important, so important. And um, like Karen, um, you know, I suffer for my art and I've been to you know London and Paris and Scotland and all of these amazing places and gone to restaurants and museums and historic places. So, but it actually, it really helps. And it's funny because I'm, now I'm, I'm writing about LA and of course I wrote The Hollywood Spy in LA. I, I know LA pretty well, but um, I'm not able to go to travel because of COVID and um, I'm sad. I would rather be taking a trip and seeing people and doing fun things. Okay. Um, for me, in all of my books, even my standalones, um, setting is as much a character in my books as actual characters. So I have to have a real affinity for a place. And, and it's funny, the first time I ever visited Charleston before I was even writing, um, I just had a very weird feeling that I had found my home. Um, and it's, and it's very strange because I had never visited before. I didn't go there as a child. I didn't live there. Um, but a few years ago, my daughter, the same one who has the, the master's degree from the, the College of Charleston, uh, go figure, um, 
um, did our ancestry and found out that we actually had ancestors who lived in Charleston in the 1700s and fought in the American Revolution. I was like, wow, okay. <laughs> so who knows? But um, but yes, I, I have to, you know, every place that I've written about, I, I have to have an affinity for it. Um, because it, the, the setting speaks to me um, just as much as the actual characters do. Yeah, New York is very much a character in the Jane Prescott series. I'm born, bred, have lived in New York my whole life. Um, so it's, it's really part of the joy of it is getting to interact with my city in a totally different way like my parents are no longer living so traveling back in time in the city I grew up in has a special pleasure for me and um yeah no it's it's uh, it's crucial okay so we have a, a shout out from author Linda Leugman oh, who had to leave <laughs> but she said thank you to each of you as I love your books that keep me smiling and smiling hmm. Okay, and then the next question, a, a, few, a few comments about <laughs> Panzer, <laughs> so that <laughs> clarified that. Um, Elaine says, I'm so close to finishing my first novel coming from a journalistic background where you write under pressure and I find I'm afraid to finish. How do you write so prolifically? Just do it, I mean, having deadlines. <laughs> It's really, um, I, I actually have a t-shirt that I made for some of my writing friends that have uh, basically a stick figure sitting at a computer and another stick figure holding a gun to the person's head. And, you know, which is, which is basically the inspiration that most writers need. So um, yeah, I'm, we're famous for procrastinating. I procrastinate a puzzle. I am always working on a puzzle at the same time as I'm writing. Um, I would rather do anything, including, you know, clean my oven. <laughs> than right those days, but having a deadline is certainly, a, a, you know, a motivator. You know, I wonder, um, Elaine, if you don't really want to finish it because you're afraid to leave your characters and like leave them, mm -hmm. I don't want to say behind, but not have that like contact up my son who's, he's now 15, but I, when he was younger, sometimes he would not read the last chapter of a book that he really, really, really loved because he never wanted it to end. And I think there are still books on his shelf. I mean, I don't understand this personally, but he won't- I just won't. like that. I'm so well, glad okay. to know I'm not alone. <laughs> I my husband the other day, I was like, I asked him about a TV show. He's like, oh, I never saw the ending. I was like, what do you mean you never saw the ending? He's like, I, I never wanted it to end. So as far as I'm concerned, it's never ending. So, but the thing is, it will never end for you. It will never end for you, but you need to put an ending on it for your readers. And I would say that everything that you hope will happen for that book can't start to happen until you finish it. Um, and it would be so sad if it didn't get to have the life that you're hoping for it. The other thing that I would say about being prolific is I don't want to go back to my day job ever. I like this job. And that is an enormous incentive to keep writing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, we don't get paid until we turn the book in. Exactly. <laughs> we can't go on book tour if we don't have a book to tour with, so. Maybe you should turn your book into a series. That's another good idea, yeah. Yeah, because mm -hmm. yeah, then you get to revisit those characters, which I have to say is one of the pros of writing a series. You don't ever, you don't have to say goodbye to the characters each book. Right. Good advice. Good advice. So I don't see any other questions in the chat, but you, if anyone has a burning question that comes to their mind, you can unmute or type it in the chat. I know, uh, I know the Maggie Hope series is being hopefully turned into a mini series or movie series. Uh, how does that work for all of you? I mean, I think any of your books, all of your books, could be easily turned into a mini series. Have you been approached? How does, how involved are you with that process? You know, it, it's funny. I'm 
currently. So the Trad Street series was actually optioned by um, 20th Century Fox a few years ago. I got paid. I was already speaking with the producer. We were talking about actors and then that fell through. That is very common. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I know better than to hold my breath. But at the moment, three different books are in different stages of film development. Whether it ever happens, I don't know. One looks very, very promising. Um, one looks very hopeful. And then the third, I'm like, yeah, probably never. So who knows? It is a crapshoot, right, ladies? Absolutely. <laughs> it's a house of cards. Close to the crapshoot. So <sighs> yeah, it's, you know, it. It's, it's the strangest thing. And I still can't believe that my husband's, my husband's a banker. He's like, so they paid you, but nothing ever happened. I'm like, yeah, you know, I just, you know, and the right, I, the revert, the right to revert it back to me so I can sell them to someone else now. I just, I don't understand how that is a workable thing, but that's how it works. So. Yeah. So a question for Susan, will you take Maggie through World War II beyond <laughs> or beyond? My, my plan is to take her through the end of World War II. And right now my plan is to end on VE Day or, you know, or thereabouts. But um, I, do, I do want it to have like a really big, cool finale and send her off well, um, not have it go on like forever. And I do think like, after the war is over, she she's earned her happily ever after for sure. So, oh, and there's another chance. There's another question. It's a it's a private one, but it's um I'm from Buffalo, and someone asked Barbara if uh, Maggie will come to Buffalo because of <laughs> Bell Aircraft there, and probably not. Uh, I did have a character from Buffalo in uh, Mrs. Roosevelt's Confidant, but I am going to have a character from Buffalo in uh, the new standalone. So Buffalo will be represented, of course, my hometown. Yeah. <laughs> so that must be someone who knows you well, <laughs> maybe. I, I think just someone who knows I'm from Buffalo. Oh, they know you're from Buffalo. We all, we stick together. You know? okay. We stick together. Excellent. Excellent. Any other questions? Or if you have questions for each other. <laughs> no. Wow. I would love to know what, what's next step. What's next up for both of you? I know you, I mean, give me dates and titles and let me know what's going on. Absolutely. Well, um, so uh, The Hollywood Spy is coming out in July, July 6th, mm -hmm. which is kind of cool because it's right around July 4th and it's a very all-American novel. So I think that's like a pretty yeah. cool release date. I don't know if I'll be going on tour for that. We can only cross our fingers, right? Yeah, so, I know. I know my publisher is like nobody's traveling through June. So yeah. Why? Are you are you with Penguin by any chance? Yeah. Um Penguin Random House, Phantom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, me too. So they said only through June. So you might be lucky. I don't know. You never know. What about you, Mariah? Um, the next Jane Prescott Death of a Showman comes out on April 13th. It's, uh, yes, Louise gets involved with a Broadway show and uh, someone is found murdered on a toilet in a fancy restaurant. Okay. Um, like right now I'm working on a novel called The Lindbergh Manny, which is a true crime novel about uh, Betty Gow, who uh, was mm. the nanny for the Lindbergh baby. Ooh, that's a good perspective. So yeah. I know you wrote you wrote um, young adults. Have you ever done any adult single titles before you did your series? I, you know, I did one years and years and years ago about celebrity obsession, mm. um, <laughs> which was very fun to write. Uh, but this is really my first standalone as a sort of fully fledged. Yeah. Very cool. I, I love that perspective of the nanny because she's just sort of a footnote to history. People haven't really delved into her. That's fascinating. I can't wait to see that. Oh, thank Very you. What, what are you working on? Um, so I do have, I have a book out. The Last Night in London is out um, April 20th. And then my seventh book and final book in the Trad Street series will be out November 2nd. And then I'm working on the, the spinoff book, which comes out next fall. So, and another collaboration with uh, Lauren um, Willig and Beatrice Williams that they've moved to next fall of 2020. 
22. So by golly, if we can't go on tour by then, I just, you know what? I'm going to just, just buy a hazmat suit and I'm going because <laughs> I don't know how much room that takes up on a plane, but I'm going. I just can't take this anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So. I also just got a question uh, about your first writing attempts. Were they published? Yes, mine was. Every book I've ever written has been, is currently in print. Oh, wow. Um, not, not in the version that it was. I mean, mm. not even anywhere close. Mm. Well, here's my tale of inspiration. My first three books were all rejected. Um, and the uh, Celebrity Obsession one was rejected by two agents on the same day. Oh, and wow. I was so depressed, I went into the darkened bathroom and sat in an empty bathtub with my clothes on and felt very sorry for myself. And my We've husband all been there. <laughs> We've all been there. It's a fun place to be. Um, and my husband knocked on the door and he said, okay, come out. This has gone on long enough. Um, and he said, have you thought of writing something for younger readers? And that very first book sold. Um, so, you know, sometimes you have to change gears from what you thought you were going to be doing. Um, I've done that a few times and it's always, it's always been a good thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. My first book was a time travel. My second book was a gothic. Mm -hmm. And then my third and fourth book were contemporary. <laughs> so I've kind of, you know, I've been all over the map. So you just kind of have to find what, you know, I think you just need to write what you want to write and then just keep going. I mean, yeah, so we've all sat in that tub. <laughs> we've all been there. <laughs> Why am I doing this? Yeah. <laughs> well, I think that that's good for people to know because sometimes you feel if you don't make it big right away, then this is not suited for you. But we've heard from other authors as well that it may not even be the third try, maybe the fourth or the fifth, and maybe they're their script is too long. They have to cut out 200 pages and whatnot. So absolutely, this is very inspiring. Distance is very important. And don't forget, always remember, you know, an author like Peter Benchley, he wrote Jaws and that was it. That was, he, it was big, it was huge and then nothing. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, there's no shame in writing multiple books before you get published. And then even, I mean, once I was, I, I did not make the New York times until my 12th book. I mean, my career didn't take off until I wrote my 12th book. Um, and that was because I switched publishers, you know, and that was, huh. I was dropped by my second pub publisher and I was thinking, oh, that's the end of it. Best thing that ever happened to me at the time, I thought it was the worst thing, but then I was with Penguin and they made my career happen. And wow, it's something special to be with an editor who really loves what you're doing. And um, it's, you know, but it's like any career, you just have to believe in what you're doing and just keep working. Even when I was rejected, I'm sure um, Mariah and Susan will agree, you get rejected, you keep writing, you start writing that. Yeah, next book. yeah. absolutely. Yeah, you don't stop. A lot of nice compliments here. Um, how people's reading list has gotten longer. <laughs> yay, yay. And and Mariah, those first one of those first books those might fly now, fly off the shelf. Yeah. Someone said, Joanna, 10 year overnight success, oh. <laughs> uh, which is nice to hear. Um, yeah. It's assuring, you know, not to give up. And then a question from Lisa Venuto. Uh, for Karen, what is a spinoff book that you mentioned coming, uh, when, maybe, when is a spinoff book that you mentioned coming out? Um, so that's yeah. The Shop on Royal Street. We actually already have a title. Uh, I, they needed it. Um, and it is coming out in the fall of 2022. So um, just, yeah, because this is 2021, right? Is that yes. funny how we have to like... <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, for, uh, sign up for my uh, my newsletter. I, I always give away stuff. I share recipes and cute pictures of my dogs. It's not always about books, but I will let you know when the net, when, when what's coming, when I'm on tour, where I'm going to be, um, and just go to my website, karen-white.com and sign up for my newsletter. Excellent, excellent. And uh, Laura wrote, she's so glad that all of you got out of that proverbial 
tub. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, we might end up back there again, but you know what? But we know what it's like. We know it's temporary. It's just a temporary. Temporary. Everything, every bad stuff. And you know, like this plague that we're all going through, it is temporary. It seems like it's lasting forever, but it's like everything in life. It's up and down, up and down, up and down. And I guess the old, I guess, cause I'm old, <laughs> I'm getting older. I, I tend to appreciate that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm also the caregiver for my elderly parents. So I'm looking at life with a lot more wisdom than I used to. And everything's temporary, you know, and, and you just have to make the best of it as learn from it, learn from that time in the tub. And then you climb out and you just start again. And I, I've heard this from so many of our patrons at the library, how books have kept them sane. And I, I you know, applaud all of you for providing such wonderful material for us to keep us engaged, to make us forget some of this plague that's going out and forget that <laughs> what year we're in, let's say, because it's just been undeniably um, challenging for so many people and your books really give them like like linda logman said it make, keeps them smiling keeps them going and that's that's a big gift that you're getting you know, thank you and i know we've all received emails from readers who who tell us that and honestly because um i i don't i don't know about you two but i there you know it's been very hard for me to write um i'm doing it but it's much slowly and much more methodical i don't i'm trying to refine that joy but you know with so much going on and again the parents the elderly parents during covid has just added so much more difficulty to this i know with small children and everything else it's it's just added a whole nother layer of this makes it so much harder but um but when I know that readers, I get lovely emails saying, thank you, thank you, thank you for being there for us during this. And that keeps me going. And, and I'm sure Susan and Mariah can agree. That's like knowing that we have readers out there waiting for that next book. It, it just means yeah. the world. It, it helps it make it less about you and more about doing something for others. Right. Right. At least that's how I felt during the pandemic, the, like the worst of it, you know? Absolutely question came in to me privately from Anne. Do your parents and spouses read your works? Hmm. Um, my, dad, my dad used to. My mother's never read one of my books. Um, uh, she has Alzheimer's now, so that's that's oh. done. Um, and now my father used to, and then now he has dementia, so he doesn't. Um, my husband has read one book, and that was The House on Trad Street. Um, and he liked it, but he does not read. <laughs> I know it's so insulting. I think my daughter does, but she doesn't want to admit it. <laughs> oh, okay. But you know, but I have extended family cousins and aunts who are avid readers and dear friends who do. So I, you know, I'm not, it is kind of like insulting though. And I know my, I have three brothers, sadly, but their wives read my books. So, so that's something. I have one brother who's claimed to fame is he's never read a book in his life. So <laughs> Where's adopted? I swear. <laughs> well, my husband not only reads, but he's one of my editors, and oh, he's very oh. good. Yeah. And he's very, very good with male characters, fight scenes, <laughs> and um, and Muppets. When the Muppets. yeah, yeah, when but, no, but he's really because he works in television. He has like really good timing. I remember like. It, in my first book, he's like, "No, this has this has to happen three times." I was like, "Well, why does it have to happen three times?" He's like, "It's the rule of three. It's funny if it happens three times." I was like, "Oh, okay," hmm. and he was right. Oh, my husband read my first YA book, and it was very sweet. When he was finished, I was incredibly nervous, and he was crying. Oh. And he said, "I'm so happy for you for oh, what you've that's written." That's lovely. I guess it's I guess it's okay. Um, he does read my mysteries, and they're not his thing. But he's like, I'm a fan, so I read them. Um, and my parents are sad, sadly passed, um, which is a shame because my mother was a mystery fanatic. Mm -hmm. She lived at uh, Murder Inc., which is a famous mystery bookstore in the city. Yes. And uh, every time I go to something like Malice Domestic, I think, oh, God, she really would have enjoyed this so much. Wow. So, 
Mm. And part of related to that question, do you all edit your books as well, or do you leave that all to the publisher? Exactly. Yeah, I, I, I have like six drafts of every single book. I mean, because I believe in writing badly. Yeah. Like, to, to get rid of the anxiety, I'm like, just put it on the page, put it on the page, and then you can make it better later. Um, so. I, I could never send something to my agent who, who's here, hi, <laughs> um, or editor without like editing it a few times through. And even then they know like it's just, it's a draft. But. Right. Um, I don't know. I guess I think I'm, I'm okay. So I'm a little OCD, like my character, Melanie. Um, I have, to, I, and again, I only write one draft, but I rewrite as I write. So oh. by the time I get to the end, it's pretty clean. And then I read through it and clean it up again. So by the time I send it to my editor, it's pretty clean. Um, I, I, I just, I couldn't, I know a lot of writers write differently. I'm like, oh, you it's like letting somebody see you naked. <laughs> you know, I was like, no, no. <laughs> gotta, gotta have that coat on, you know, before I send it. So, and, and I've been with my editor now since 2004. I mean, seven, oh my gosh. No. Yeah. yeah. 17 years. Holy cow. Yeah. And um, so, you know, you would think that I'd be, you know, but yeah. So I make her job not easy, but less stressful. Mm. But I listen to every word. When she says something, I listen because it's obviously something I miss. And I've always agreed 100% with anything she's ever pointed out. So we're a good team. She's not allowed to ever leave me. <laughs> I will haunt her. <laughs> so you you talk about, oh, there's a, another question. Susan answered the question. I wondered if a family edit it solicited or not. Okay, that was a, a question for man. Uh, and now I forgot my question for you. Oh, you talk about how the characters speak to you. And I've heard this from several authors that they just, they, they come to them repeatedly in, 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 throughout the day in strange scenarios and they force the, the writer so to, to write, to, to create that book. Do your characters always take you in a direction <laughs> that you do not want your characters to go in? Because your character is saying, I want to do this, and you're saying, no, it doesn't work with the arc of the story. Do you ever have that situation where you have something in mind, but the character is telling you something different? The characters always know sense? better. The characters always know best. Yes. I, I really. listen to my characters. Right. Um, because the the few times that I have tried to outline, total waste of time. Because after the you know during the first chapter, they're already going somewhere else, and so the rest of the outline is a complete waste of time. Which is why I don't bother doing them anymore. Oh. Um, so yeah, I don't, and th that is why I don't do outlines because I don't want to argue with them. I just like okay, let's let's go this way, and it's they're never wrong. So you're they're driving you. They're yeah. driving your story. That's interesting. No, I, very interesting. Um, maybe there are some these spirits coming to you. Maybe I'm just. And, you know, no, I, but I've heard you're talking to me in my head. What does that mean? Right? Jennifer Donnelly had told us about one of her books that she wrote for young adults, and this one character I forget now the title of the book. Uh, Anne maybe remembers, and she said it was someone who was buried in a grave, and it ended up being part of her story but the character was so vivid and so loud mm -hmm. so loud that she had to stop on what she was working on to write that other novel and that's yeah. so powerful and that that's amazing it's like the characters are selecting you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to tell their story so well we probably have time for one more question and then we will conclude the program we have a lot of nice comments in the chat about how much they enjoyed uh Meeting you, hearing from you. These wonderful book talks have been a godsend during this time. I so look forward to these kinds of events. Thank you for giving us your time to connect with us. And I will second that uh, because we're so grateful to you for taking time out of your day or your writing time uh, to join us and, and tell us more about your books. 
Uh, I, oh, some more messages here. And the bookseller wasn't able to join us tonight, Jennifer Cohn, but the Village Bookstore, which is our local bookstore here in Pleasantville, does have copies for anyone who'd like to purchase. I think we have some signed copies available as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did put it in the, in the chat earlier. So I hope you will be able to uh, support the local bookstore. I, they, they do mail out. So if you're not in the Westchester County area, uh, keep that in mind as well. We, we like to support our local businesses. So mm -hmm. thank you to everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Thank, she wrote, thank you, dear writers. Oh, I lost it because so many. Uh, thank you, dear writers. It's fascinating to hear about the behind the scenes info. So thank you. thanks for having yeah. us. And good yeah. to Good to meet y'all in person. I yeah, hope we yeah. fun. <laughs> I mean, well, not in person, but I hope we do get to meet in, in the very near future. I feel like this is as person as I get anymore, but I know. Um, <laughs> right, yeah. definitely, definitely. And I did want to mention for those of you who are still staying on that we have an addition to the March 18th. Uh, book Yaya yeah, yeah, with our cookbook authors. We have this five towns one book with a vis virtual visit and discussion with author, I'm looking for her first, Isabel Wilkerson, the author of Cast, The Origins of Her Discontents. And the dates are here for some additional talks about Cast, but the main talk with the author is on April 25th, which I'm not sure which day of the week that is, but it will be at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So if anyone would like to to sign up for that. Uh, that'll be our next uh, big author event. Okay. And that's all I wanted to say for tonight. So thank you so very much to everyone who stayed with us throughout the program yes. and uh, to our guests. This was really wonderful. Thank you for having us. I so appreciate it. Yes, Definitely. Thank you, thank you, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>